beautiful hymn. Appreciate that. 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're looking together at verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 1. I'll read a little, then we'll pray, and we'll talk a little bit about what brings us to this chapter here today. 1 Kings chapter 18. The Bible says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all fountains of water and unto all brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? Let's pray, and we'll catch up, and we'll go forward. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for this day that you've granted us for your people to gather together, Lord. Thank you for the place that you've provided. Thank you, Lord, for the good fellowship that we've enjoyed, the good music today that has stirred our hearts and directed us to you and to that uh, blessed assurance that we have in the Lord. Now, Lord, as we consider your servant Elijah, his times and his ministry and his development today, Lord, as we go forward in this, as we're leading up to this contest to allow you, God, to display yourself strong May we ourselves be prepared, Lord, to receive what you would have for us from your word. And we'll certainly thank you for it. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I'm thankful today that you're here. I'm believing today that the Lord would have something here for us in the life of Elijah. Before we go forward in this chapter, let me review with you just a few things. This is our, I think, fifth sermon on this topic. But we first of all considered Elijah the man in his times. We talked about to what country Elijah is a prophet to. Elijah is a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. We talked about how Israel, a family that came from Abraham, entered into Egypt that way and came out some 400 years later a nation. And we watched as their development would take place, as God would use Moses to lead them out and Joshua to lead them into the promised land. We saw that first great victory that they had at Jericho. And we were reminded, and we'll talk about that in a moment, why that's important to the story of Elijah. But we know that Israel, particularly talking here about the northern kingdom, has strayed from the Lord. With just a, a short 58 years from the time of David and then Solomon, where Israel is at its zenith, at its peak, where people are coming from all over the world to see what God is doing in Israel, the nation, to see the wisdom that God has given to Solomon, to see how he has organized and orchestrated that country, sending gifts and really wanting to know all about it. They have making a, taken a very severe turn. It began when Solomon's son, Rehoboam, took bad counsel. And he listened to those that were his contemporaries rather than listening to the old men that had been around his father. And uh, he gave him bad advice. Be careful who you're listening to. Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. But what do we see here? We see his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate. How? Day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. There's a lot of bad counsel in the world today. There's many voices. There are many avenues for voices today. Young people, there are many people who are working to get your ear, to get your heart, to lead you in their path and in their direction. And if you're not careful, that's a path of destruction. For the case of Israel, Rehoboam did in fact lead them in a path of destruction, and the nation began a civil war, civil unrest. The north would go underneath a man by the name of Jeroboam, the south under Rehoboam. So there in that northern kingdom, largest in size and in quantity, Jeroboam, in order to keep power there, he uh, wanting to do what he perceived to be right, did something wrong in trying to keep the people with him, seemed right to him, but it was wrong in his attempts. 
He divided the people even further. He led them in the worship of golden calves, and he sinned against God in that. And where God had given him an opportunity to be established, Jeroboam shot himself in the foot for sure. And now some years have passed and a few generations, and we see Ahab sitting on the throne of Israel. Ahab, uh, two times in 1 Kings chapter 16, is described as having been the worst and having done more to provoke the Lord to anger than anybody else before him. Ahab went so far as to do something that seemed like a light thing, like it wasn't a big deal at all, and he took to himself a wife from one of their enemy uh, neighboring countries. He took a woman by the name of Jezebel to be his wife. And Jezebel was from Zidon, and her father was the king there. And so that spoke of affinity. That spoke of a relationship established between Israel now and a neighboring kingdom, a neighboring kingdom that were full of pagans, full of people who had rejected the living God and had fought against God. It was so bad in the times of Elijah that a man, even knowing that Jericho was a cursed city and that there would be a curse upon the man that would rebuild it, there was a man, the scripture gives us at the conclusion of chapter 16, that built the walls of Jericho again. He lost his oldest and his youngest son, just as God said would happen to the man who rebuilt Jericho. And it was a uh, right in God's face to go back against the things that God had done for them. Jericho, that mighty city, represented so much about what was wrong in that land and those that had opposed God. But it also spoke to the fact that God had given them victory and somebody was looking to work directly against what God had done. That's a rough time. Elijah is a troubled man. He's living in the mountain range of Gilead. He's called Elijah the Tishbite. He's uh, rough and rugged, so to speak. He's bothered by what he's seeing. He begins to pray. James chapter 5 speaks to this. He begins to pray and wants to see the Lord do something. He wants his people, the nation of Israel, to have an opportunity to see the real power and the true power of God. He wants it to be in comparison to the false gods that they follow. We talked about that as much as a, maybe a parent or a pastor or even as we would desire in our country that people would see the true and living God, that there would be to them an expression of his power and his authority, that people would turn to him. And Elijah praying that God would do something and God does in fact move and God sends Elijah to the king Ahab to tell him that there's not going to be rain or dew for three years. Elijah then is directed by the Lord to go to the brook Cherith the word cherith speaks of a cutting place. It is there that the Lord will feed him by ravens, bringing him morning and evening meat and bread, and he'll drink from the brook cherith, and he'll be settled there. We talked about all the things about that, but the Lord is teaching him that he can provide for him. Once the brook dries up, the Lord directs Elijah to go to the most uh, far out spot. You would think God would send his prophet. He sends him to the very nation that Jezebel is from, the enemy where there are those who worship Baal, and you would think that it would not be the spot where God would put him, but that's exactly where God sends him. And the Lord says, you're going to be cared for by a widow. It doesn't say what kind of widow, whether it should be a rich widow or a widow in power and position, but he finds out when he comes to the city that outside the gate is a widow who's gathering sticks to build a fire. She's poor. She has no money for fuel oil. She has no help. And this is the one that God would seek to use. And we talked about how God uses the ravens, the dirty birds, and God uses the widow, the widow in a neighboring nation, an enemy nation. And yet through all of that, God is teaching Elijah, one, that he can provide for him. Two, humility. And three, that not only can God provide for Elijah, but God can use Elijah to provide for others. Elijah meets this woman and he says, would you bring me some water? As she's going to get the water, he says, hold on, would you bring me a biscuit? If you allow that, all right? And she says, sir, I, I, I've got these two sticks. I'm getting ready to build a fire. I'm getting ready to make one last meal. And then my son and I, we're going to die. That's the predicament that she was in. And Elijah said, you go and fix mine first. And I promise you this, because the Lord has spoken, the Lord's going to meet your needs. And the Lord did just that. Every day she went to that same barrel of meal. Every day she went to that same cruise of oil and she found enough supply for that day. And just like the Lord had taught Elijah to trust him day by day at the brook Cherith, now God is teaching Elijah to do the same and those that are around him. And friend, this life really is a day by day life. 
looking to Him, trusting Him, depending on Him each and every day, d desiring that things would stay fresh, not resting on our leaves, not being settled on where we've been and what we've done or who we are, who we think we are, but rather asking the Lord each and every day, Lord, use me, Lord, supply for me, Lord, prepare me for this day and the challenges of this day. Elijah is there with her, and that provision last Sunday morning, we saw it, it doesn't run out. But then something terrible happens. Out of nowhere, seemingly, this son, this child, becomes sick and he dies. And this woman's immediate thoughts are to Elijah, and what have you to do with, what have I to do with you? Oh, thou man of God, did you come here to bring judgment on me? Are you calling to my past sins? Is that why this has happened? Elijah says, give me the child. He takes the child to his private quarters, and there he prays over the child. And really, in a sense, Elijah asks the same things of the Lord. What, what's going on here? Why have you done this? What are you doing? And the Lord responds and heals the child. He presents the child to the mother. Look with me now, 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 24. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a what? A man of God. And that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. He, remember this about Zidon and the place called Zarephath where Elijah was sent. Brook Cherith was a cutting place. The place called Zarephath or Zidon is called the smelting place or the refinery. Elijah was being cut on. Elijah was being prepared for the next challenge, for the next step in his ministry. He was being refined. He was being purified. And it comes to a conclusion in this that the woman states two things about him. Number one, she says, I know who you are. Your testimony is established with me. You are a man of God. And number two, the word of God is established with me. And friend, there's nothing that you and I could desire any more for our lives than for our testimony to be just that one, that we are the people of God. That people may look upon our testimony in the good days, the bad days, the difficult days, through crisis, uh, through setbacks, and that they might see the Lord and His faithfulness in our life and our faithfulness to Him. And friend, that the Word of God, that the truth of the Word of God, that the power of the Word of God would be revealed through our lives. That just as we're able to look at Paul's life and see that God's grace was sufficient, that folks would be able to look at our lives and our testimony and say the same thing. And in your life, God would seek to, do, to establish your testimony, your faith, your confidence in Him. And God wants to establish the authority and the power of His Word in your life. It's not always easy. It's difficult at times. Waiting for a raven, being humble enough to allow a widow to go to the barrel every day. But yet through all of that, Elijah was prepared for the next step. 1 Kings 18, we read a moment ago, God comes again to Elijah and he says, now I want you to go and show yourself unto Ahab. During these years now, three and a half years that have transpired, things have happened in Samaria. There was no rain to water the crops. There was no rain to make and to have provision for the animals and for the livestock to be able to drink from. There was not even dew. They went out in the morning and checked to see if the grass was wet to go to the fields when they'd been planted to see if there was even any of that dew that God provided. You'll remember we spent some time establishing that God told the children of Israel that one of the evidences of his blessing on their life in Israel and in the land would be that God would send the rain, that he would send the former rain, and he would send the latter rain, that they would have what was required for that land to be lush and to grow and to continue to develop and be fruitful. And so by the removal of that rain, the removal of that dew, that was a specific revelation to them that God is not pleased. One of the problems that they had with idolatry is that they had began to give thanks for rain and dew to Baal. Because Baal was the God, the false God, the deity that they would worship and were being taught to worship, that he was the God of rain, that he was the God of thunder, that he was the God of fertility or fruitfulness. And so it really, if you look at it on the onset, it's really bringing the people to a point. Go three and a half years in a famine. Go three and a half years without water and a drought that leads to a famine. And you can imagine how complicated it is. The Bible says it's not just a famine, but that it is a what? It is a sore famine. Ninety-eight times in the Bible, the word sore is used to express in an expression of adding to something to, see, to tell you how exceedingly difficult it was. For example, you know the difference between major surgery and minor surgery. 
Minor surgery is anything that's happening to you. Major is anything that's happening to me. You know the difference between a, re a recession and a depression. Huh? A recession is when your neighbor loses his job. A depression is when you lose your job, right? Sore means it was bad. That's, 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 that's something that's called humor. It's okay to laugh. You can smile a little bit, okay? With you. And it's, it's gracious to smile when I'm trying to be funny, okay? To say that it was a sore famine means it's beyond just a famine, but it's a sore. I mean, it has come to the extreme. It is cutting deep. It is cutting so deep that the king himself has left his palace, has left his position, and has gone out now on a search party looking for grass, looking for some place, searching down in the valleyways, searching near around where the uh, uh, creeks have, go, have flowed flow and have dried up, looking and hoping that maybe there's just a little bit of vegetation there so that they would be able to cut that vegetation and take it back and feed it to their animals. There's a statement that is used, and I want you to see it, and Ahab and his direction to this man to help him with this in chapter 18 regarding the beasts. Look at verse 5, the conclusion of it, and it says that we lose not all the beasts. You see, so much of their military, so much of their position in life as those who would farm and as those who would war was relevant to the health of their livestock. They needed them. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that some trust in horses and some trust in chariots. That was a means of warfare. You know, for example, if I were to say to you today, if we were in some sort of military conflict, if I were to say to you, all of our tanks, all of our ships, all of our planes, they're broken. They're not working. They're not functioning. When the enemy attacked in Pearl Harbor and they, they bombed our Navy years ago, they were looking to hit at that time where the Navy, a good portion of things were parked and stationed at that time. That was a cunning attack. And they were seeking to knock us out with that blow to get rid of our force to be able to defend and or to be able to go on the offense. So you can understand as a king, when you go out to get in your chariot and the guy says, hey, I hate to tell you this, but your favorite horse will pull number two up. They're down to the bare nubs. They've got Hank and Kalijah now. If you don't know who they are, that's our mini horse and our mini donkey that we have. They're the, they're the mascots for the church. Kalijah, the horse is a mascot for some, and Hank the donkey. Anyway, we leave it at that. All right, so. Oh, here we go again. He said, man, oh, we're, 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 we're running down here. Ahab said, well, hey, go get me some milk. And they said, listen, I hate to tell you this, but that uh, dairy cow you had, how about a goat? This is getting bad. This is sore. This is a sore famine. This is exceedingly, but this is touching all of us. I suspect for a while the king said, well, I'll be okay as long as I have what I need. But it was coming to the point where even Ahab himself was lacking. And so he calls for a man by the name of Obadiah. The name Obadiah means servant of God. You see another Obadiah in the Bible whom God used as a prophet. This is not that same Obadiah. There are 13 Obadiahs in the Bible. This particular one is called the governor of the household of Ahab. It's told to us in verse 3 that this Obadiah feared the Lord. How? Greatly. So get the picture. Elijah has been in hiding now these three some years. He had gone and pronounced to Ahab that there would be no dew or rain. For three some years, what started as a dry day led to a dry season, which led to a dry year, which led to another dry year and to a third dry year. Imagine now the creeks are cracked from dry ground. The fields are dusty. Dust is everywhere. There's no sense in planning. They've used everything that they had in reserves. Ahab has literally sent as many people as he could to all the nations around to try and find Elijah. We saw this last week, verse 10. He went so far as to say to those nations, swear to me that he is not there. In other words, if you're hiding him, and if I find out later on, we're going to have a problem. I need to know beyond a doubt 
that you do not know where this person is because it was Elijah who had come to Ahab and told him what was to happen and what the problem would be. And so Ahab one day says to Obadiah, his right-hand man, if you will, you go that way and I'll go this way and you see if you can find anything at all that we can use to give provision for our animals because we don't want all of them to die. Obadiah sets out on his journey and he runs into somebody, not by accident. He runs into Elijah. Look with me, would you please, again at verse 7. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. Now remember, who is Obadiah? The Bible has established to us that he is a governor for Ahab, that he helps in Ahab's household. He is a man who fear, greatly fears the Lord. It's been told us here by his testimony that he is one who helped hide prophets of God from Jezebel when she would have taken their lives. And now this Obadiah meets up with Elijah. Verse 7, and as Obadiah was in the way. Now I think there's a general reading of that. He was in the way. But I think there's a, a profounder reading of that as well. The way, meaning he was where God wanted him to be. There was a fellow by the name of Abraham who sent a servant to find a bride for his wife. We referenced it with Elijah finding the widow outside the city. That servant made this statement to the, to the person responsible for that bride to this effect. He said, I being in the way, the Lord led me. You are going to encounter in life divine appointments. There are people whom the Lord is going to allow your path to cross with so that his work and his will can be further accomplished. Obadiah was a man seemingly second to Ahab. If you had looked at Obadiah from the onset, if you had just simply known from the outside, you would have said, this is Obadiah working for Ahab. And yet the Lord knew about Obadiah that he what? That he feared him. I'll not pass sentence on Obadiah. I'll not judge Obadiah and his decisions. I will tell you that the Lord made it a point to tell you that he feared him. I will tell you that the Lord established his testimony that at his own personal loss, at what would Jezebel had done to Obadiah if she had found out that he was hiding prophets of the Lord whom she was trying to kill? I suspect Obadiah would have come to a real quick end of his life. I see Obadiah as a person living and accepting where he's at and dealing with things as many of us are dealing with things. How many of you work in a place where directionally you look at the workplace and you look at some of the things that they're presenting and it's becoming increasingly difficult for a believer knowing where people are going and what they're heading into. Corporate America has been hijacked. Hijacked by greed. Hijacked by the bottom line and now hijacked by those who would seemingly threaten them and threaten their position and call them various names to get them to succumb to a pressure, a craziness that's running rampant in our society today. Where a guy ought to be able to go to work or a gal ought to be able to go to work and do their job, they're now being forced into sensitivity training. Well, look at me funny now. But we find ourselves there. We have folks involved in the military. And increasingly, people are not joining in the, in the military for fear of having to deal with some of these. I think one of the reasons why people don't run for politics and don't get involved in that is because of the nonsense and the people that you have to deal with. But somewhere in all of this, I'm rem reminded of what the Lord prayed for his disciples that they would not be, what, removed from the world. Wouldn't it be great if we could all go and live on the side of a mountain somewhere and be left alone? until it's not so great and until there's problems there. Because the problem with that concept is it's imperfect people. So what are we called to do? We're called to be salt. We're called to be light in this world. We're here for a reason. You're here for a reason. You're here for a purpose. I'm not, and I would not argue or disagree if you think Obadiah was a compromising this or that, that's your business. But I see Obadiah as a guy growing up someplace Got into a position probably being trustworthy and honest. Ahab knew he could trust the guy. He gave him the spot. I see Obadiah watching as things unfold, as Jezebel's brought in, as he sees his people going towards the false god. 
I see this crazy woman Jezebel one day start killing the prophets of the Lord, Nobadiah, probably a man of means and position and opportunity, says, I must do something. And so he did something. He hid those men, trying to figure it out. Hold on. He's out looking for grass because Ahab trusts him, and Elijah shows up. Now look, you have to look, put yourself in Obadiah's sandals for a minute. For three and a half years, I suspect he has heard Elijah this, Elijah that. Where is this guy at? Ahab has sent people all over, sitting on his chair somewhere. Obadiah may be sitting to the other side of him, and people coming back giving reports. I've been here, no sign of Elijah. I've been here, no sign of Elijah. Maybe even in his heart, Obadiah is saying, good. Go, Elijah, go. Go, Elijah, go. Go, Elijah, go. And Ahab is looking feverishly, and now all of a sudden, Elijah shows up. Obadiah is faced with something here because now Ahab says to Obadiah, I want you to do something. I want you to go and tell Ahab that I'm coming to see him. And Obadiah says, whoa, hold on. Do you want me to get killed? Do you know who I am? I'm on your side. I've helped the prophets of the Lord, but if I go and tell Ahab that by a happen chance, I came across Elijah, the one that you've looked everywhere for, under every rock, under every tree, that all of a sudden I know where he's at. He's going to kill me thinking that I'm in this with you. Elijah will even say, and I want you to see it very quickly, and I must move through this here. I want you to notice here, when Obadiah sees him, verse 7, he makes this expression. Number one, he fell on his face and said, Art thou my Lord Elijah? Now, I want you to see verse 9. And he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldst deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? Two times here he said, You're my Lord and I'm your servant. I answer to you. I I'm following you. You're my captain. Do you, do, you, do you know who I am? But I'm on your side. I want you to see what Elijah responds to him. Verse 10. As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my, my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it sh shall come to pass as the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Several times Obadiah will reference that he is a servant of Elijah. And Elijah will put back to him that you need to go and tell Ahab, and he'll call Ahab his Lord, thy Lord Ahab. And Obadiah says, whoa, 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 don't you know who I am? Don't you know who I serve? Don't you know who I represent? I I'm on your side. You know, there is a defining line for all of us, for the Obadiahs and for the Elijahs that there needs to be a development and understanding of what side we're on. I fear the day where good people are asked to do wrong things against God's Word in the name of keeping the law. We've experienced some of those things already in the last few years in our country. There were people who were very, very, very conflicted in enforcing upon churches the laws that were wanting to be passed or the mandates that were being passed by the federal government to be placed on folks. You understand that in the name of man, there does come a time where people have to say, who do we obey? Who is my master? Is my master the Lord, the Word of God, or is my master man? You know, that's one of the things, wonderful things about our country. We have been able now for these years to be at peace with people, and that's why we're to pray for kings. And that's why we're to pray for those that are in leadership that we can continue to have a peaceful, prosperous, fruitful ministry. Because it, it, it complicates things when the work of God and the Word of God is restricted by those that are in authority. But do you understand today that there are countries around the world where people are not allowed to gather and sing about Jesus? They're not allowed to come together and follow the Word of God as their conscience dictates. 
There will be a day, if things do not turn around here very quickly, there will be a day when the Bible in our country will be condemned, already is by certain folks, for teaching bad science, for being hateful, for not being accepting enough. Because you cannot read and believe and accept the Bible and not look at the winds that are driving the sails today in our culture and say, that is wrong. And it's not just because I don't like it. It's not just because of my opinion. It's because of what does the Word of God say about it. And Obadiah, God, I believe, was using him where he was at. But now comes a defining moment. Obadiah, you go and tell Ahab I'm coming to him. Obadiah says, I, how do I know this? How do I know that you're not going to be picked up by the Spirit of the Lord and not actually follow through with this? Elijah gives the promise. Verse 15, and Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. Look at verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. It's easy to read past that and not really grab a hold of what Obadiah's concerns are. Obadiah's concerns were that he would be linked to Elijah. Now, one could argue that Elijah's right and he's truth. I get it. But Obadiah is very concerned about that. There was a time in the life of Israel where there had been great sin in the camp. And the Bible says that Moses did something. He made a line and he asked a question. He said, who is on the Lord's side? And I'm afraid that at some point you and I may be asked the very same thing. Who's on the Lord's side? Now we can be tactful, we can be polite, and we can be gracious. But we are to be a people of truth. We are to be a people of the book. We're to answer the call of our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be true to that. Regardless of the pressures. Regardless of the consequence. We're to be directed by the Lord in that. Obadiah, you tell Ahab, Elijah will meet him. Elijah is a picture, a type of the Word of God. Elijah will proclaim the words of God to Ahab. He's a picture of authority. He's a picture of God's authority. Now I want you to see with me, if you would please, in verse 17, and it came to pass... When Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, listen, listen to this, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Obadiah tells Ahab, you're going to see Elijah. He makes the right decision. Obadiah does. Ahab meets Elijah. And what is Ahab's response? Why had Ahab looked so hard to find Elijah? Why had he sent people to every nation and every country with this on his heart and this on his mind? He says to Elijah, are you the one that does what? Troubles us. Are you the one? By exact word here, his expression to him, are you the one that troubleth Israel? Hold your place there and turn with me to the book of Joshua. Joshua, please. In Joshua chapter 6, on in to Joshua chapter 7, you have the story of a man by the name of Achan, whom God had given very specific commands to Israel in regarding to Jericho and leaving things alone and not taking the things that were a part of Jericho. He had very specifically told him and them collectively not to. As a matter of fact, and again going back to the rebuilding of Jericho and the, the insult to God in that. But if you're looking in Joshua chapter 6, You'll see very quickly here, let the preacher find his notes. There we go. You'll find very quickly that there is a warning that is given that if anything is taken, that they would be one that would trouble all of Israel and that there would be a problem that would come from that. In verse 18, it speaks to that. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse, and notice these next three words, and what? And trouble it, and trouble it. Go to chapter 7 and verse 25. We know that Achan did in fact take the things that God had told him not to, and he had hid them. And because of Achan's sin, there was sin in the camp, and there was judgment in the camp. 
In Joshua chapter 7 and verse 25, And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. When Achan violated the command of God, he troubled all of Israel. And in order for that to be dealt with, Achan and those that were with Achan were put to death. When Ahab saw Elijah, he said, Are you the one that what? Troubleth Israel. What have you done that has brought this judgment on us? What have you done that has brought this situation that we have no dew and we have no rain and we have a sore famine? What do you suppose Ahab would have done to Elijah if he could have in all those times he was looking for him? Put him to death. You're the one causing this problem. Notice Elijah's response to him, would you please? Verse 18, and he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. There were several things that were designated here as the problem. Number one, they had turned away from the commands of God. Number two, idolatry obviously was rampant. Number three, their intermingling with those who were not true believers and true followers of God had created these problems in their country. He said, it's not me that's troubled Israel. It's you. It's your father. It's these idols. It's a lack of following God's commandments. It's a lack of being a people who are true and pure to the word of God. Sometimes we have trouble in our life. Sometimes we have problems. And we try to figure out who that person is that's caused that. Sometimes people like to put a face on their problem rather than really humbly coming to the problem and saying, okay, what is it in this that I have done that needs to be corrected? We are a generation of victims. Well, I did what I did because so-and-so did what they did, and now I've got these problems. Now, you got the problems because of the decisions that you've made. Now, mind you, there may have been some difficulty in leading to that. I will give you that, and maybe you didn't know, and that's, that's fine. But the reality is your decision brought you to that destination. If you're sick of that destination, let's make better decisions. Let's not look for somebody else to push this on. Hey, Elijah, it's your fault. And like, that's not my fault. There's a long line of bad decisions. It's a long line of disobedience that's brought us to this. It's not me. In our lives, in our own personal relationships, when we look at things, well, what do we tend to do? Do we tend to blame God if God had done this differently, if God hadn't let that happen, if God this or God, if that person? How about this? How about we just today accept humbly and own bad directions, bad decisions, bad relationships. Say, listen, we're wrong in that. Ahab was wrong in those areas. It's time to be corrected. And then comes the challenge. Verse 19, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the groves 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Jezebel's got 850 people underneath her prophets, underneath of her. And Elijah says, Let's, I want to meet you and meet them and all the people of Israel on Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel speaks of a mountain range, but there is one particular mountain that stands out 1,700 feet above sea level. Mount Carmel speaks of a place of vineyards or fruitfulness, a garden. It's a lush place. Elijah wants to take them to the very spot that speaks of all the things that God has done for them to allow God to prove himself to them. You know, the Bible says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. There is something that everybody needs to do. Everybody needs to allow God to be proven to themselves. As much as a parent wants that for their child... Young people, God wants to be proven to you who he is and what he's capable of in your life. It's not enough to run on somebody else's faith. It's not enough to run on somebody else's answers to prayer. 
It's not enough for us to simply look back and say, well, I saw what God did there. God wants to work in our lives, and God wants to show Himself strong in our life. I like what the Lord used the Apostle Paul to say, for I know whom I have believed, right? And am what? Persuaded. Are you persuaded? Unfortunately, oftentimes people will live and their testimony in the Lord will be this, I know whom I believed in. I know who I believed in, and thank God for that. But have you been persuaded in who He is and what He's capable of? And until in your heart and your life you get into what I call that persuasion process of allowing the Lord to prove Himself to you, then it's difficult for us to step out. Elijah, the brook, the widow's house, God proved Himself. Obadiah, big decision, whose side are you on? Go and face your fear. Go and tell Ahab, you found me, and then I'm on my way. And he did that. That's God proving. And God wants to prove Himself to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, can we? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. A lot of stuff there to consider. A lot of things to think on. There's old Elijah, once again, following the directions of the Lord, being obedient. God's bringing him along, faithful, where he's supposed to be, doing what he's supposed to do. God keeps moving Elijah through his plan for his life. There's Obadiah. Obadiah seeing something that needs to be done, doing right, fearing the Lord, having opportunity for greater commitment. So many lessons to be learned there. And then there's that consideration of who is it that's troubled Israel. So oftentimes in our lives we miss out on getting things squared away because we just struggle in recognizing and admitting where the trouble is at. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Who would say, Preacher, there was something in that today for me, something that the Lord would use in my life through the testimony of Elijah and Obadiah. You'd say, Preacher, please pray for me as the Lord deals in my life and my heart. Would you lift your hand? Anybody like that? Many hands this morning. I trust today as the Lord works in your heart, whatever it may be, whatever area there, maybe it's further commitment, stepping up, knowing who you serve, why you serve Him. If it's in that department of, you know, wanting to be persuaded, whatever it may be, I hope you'll let the Lord work in your heart. If you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, wouldn't embarrass you for anything, but if, friend, if you're here and you do not know for sure today that heaven is your home, don't wait another day, don't wait another week. Come today and let somebody show you from God's Word the best news you can ever see, the Gospel. Who Jesus is and why that's important to you and what He's done for you if you'll receive Him. There are men that would love to sit with you. There are ladies that would love to talk with ladies about the Gospel. So if you're here today and you'd say, Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I don't know for sure that heaven is my home. Please pray for me. I don't have that assurance. Would you lift your hand that I might pray for you today and say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. Would you raise your hand? Can I pray with you and pray for you? Father in heaven, we trust that you'll move and that the Word of God will not return void, but you'll accomplish your purposes, Lord, as you would choose to do. Let's stand to our feet, please. We'll have a time of invitation. The altar is open. If the Lord would lead you this way, you respond to Him. 